This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I am taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better. And I will never be the same again. Amen. May be seated. And as you're being seated, I want to make mention that if you're here and you're a young adult, you're, out, you're finished with high school, maybe you're in college, maybe you're doing vocational training, but you're a young adult, we have a young adult's lunch once a month, which I believe is on the third Sunday of every month. So I would encourage you to go to that. And also, if you're a young couple, a young couple getting started in life, in marriage, in family, I would encourage you to go to the young couples class immediately before this service. It'll help you, amen. You know, it's so wonderful, everyone's having these new babies, so wonderful, amen. But the, the first baby, it is an awakening of sorts. And then you find out all that's involved and you're a little sleep deprived, so you need some help, need some encouragement, you need some wisdom, some guidance, amen. Need some people encouraging you, telling you, you can do that. So I would encourage you, if you're a young couple, to go to the young couples class. Thank you for being faithful in church with your family. Thank you for being faithful with the tithe and for helping us make phase two a reality. And thank you for every week talking to someone about the Lord and inviting them to church. We've been in a new series entitled Singleness of Purpose. Singleness of Purpose. And the word that has really resonated with me, it was resonating with me when pastor ministered during the first service was the word focus, focus, being focused in what God has called you to do, being focused in your work, in your career, being focused in your family, in your marriage, in your parenting, singleness of purpose. And we've been learning how faith in God requires singleness of purpose, which is integrity of heart, for without singleness of purpose or integrity, Faith will not work for you. You know, someone might be new to Faith Christian Center and say, well, you know, I've, I've been to another full gospel church or I've been to a faith ministry, but somehow Faith Christian Center is a little different. What's the difference? In the spring when we began the series, pastor did a message entitled The Second Rail of Faith. We, we don't just teach faith, we teach faith and character. And other words would be honor integrity. You might say, that sounds old-fashioned. Yes, old-fashioned values, the kind that built our nation into a great nation. Jesus said in Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So it's not just a matter of, I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I love you, word. We're to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Now, when you're born again, you are brought into right standing with God. The word we use for that is justification. And if you read Romans, and Romans is a tough one to work through, but when you read Romans, Paul explains that when you're born again, when you're justified, when you're brought into the family of God, that the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it is imputed to you. It is credited to you. We, we don't earn it. But there is a misunderstanding in the body of Christ. And it is this, yes, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, it is imputed, it is credited, it is given to me, but I am also to live this life as the righteousness of God in Christ, which gets into character and gets into conduct. Why don't we all say it? Say, say conduct. See, that, that's why we as believers, we just can't do what everybody else is doing. We just can't act or say or do what everybody in the world is doing because, yes, the righteousness of Christ has been credited or imputed to us, but in Christ we are actually to live as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And you, you name any sin, 
Paul writes, that is what some of you were. The point being, in Christ, we're, we're not that any longer. So before someone was saved, they, have, they may have been a liar. What's a liar? Somebody who lies, not just once, not just twice, consistently and repeatedly. And Paul says, that is what some of you were. The point being, you're a new man, you're a new woman in Christ Jesus. And you now live your life differently. And so Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. So it's not just faith. It is faith and character. It's not just faith. It is faith and conduct. It's not just faith. It is faith and integrity. It's not just faith. It is faith and honor. It's not just faith. It is faith and moral values. And where do we get those values from? Well, we don't get them from the culture because out there in the culture, that's changing every day. We get those values that we live our lives by from the word of God. And we've been challenging you to just put God first and see what he will do. People have trouble believing God. They have trouble in prayer. They have trouble getting their prayers answered because they lack singleness of purpose. They lack focus. They're trying this and they're trying that. You know, last Sunday I mentioned how at Faith Christian Center we don't do multi-level schemes. We don't, if you, you came to me and said, Pastor Austin, I found out about this and they tell me I'm gonna double my money by Friday, <laughs> I would warn you that to not trust in that because you're gonna get your head handed to you. And it's not Bible, but it's true. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So we're talking about faith, but also character, conduct, values, integrity. People have no faith and they have trouble believing God and they have trouble praying and getting prayers answered because they lack integrity. Their actions have no integrity. Their words have no integrity. And the, the, one of the best definitions of integrity, it is the state of being undivided. You know, where Jessica's parents live, they're, they're redoing the road there. They're doing a, a big new bridge. It is a huge project, and they're, they're quite a ways into that. But Jessica's mom told me that in the past week or two, they were jackhammering out all of the concrete that had been poured. Well, why? Well, someone did a test. Someone did an analysis, and they discovered what? A problem, a lack of integrity somewhere. You know, and you might be on a country road and there'd be a lack of integrity. Well, bumping up and down in your pickup's one thing, but none of us want to drive across a bridge with a lack of integrity. So why do people falter? And why do people fail? And why do things seem to fall apart and self-destruct? It is because there is a lack of integrity. Christian integrity is the state of not being divided in your words and your actions. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and verse 7, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So how we think and how we see things is so important. And that's why you've got to be careful with what you see and what you watch and what you hear and listen to. And that's why you've got to be careful in your fellowship and careful with the words that you allow to be sown into your life and in your heart. For as a man thinketh, so is he. As a woman thinketh, so is she. You know, growing up, one of the books my father gave me was Napoleon Hill's book, Think and Grow Rich. You know, that sure beats think and be a failure, think and grow poor, think and grow rich. And the basic thesis is this, that a man with his, his thought life can direct the course of his life. At the, the power lunch earlier in the year, pastor referenced an author. And I have on my desk a small book he wrote about a man's thought life. And this is something, a little short book written more than 100 years ago, but how a man or woman by, by their thought life, they, they can direct the course of their life to do great things or to fail and to falter. How we think about ourselves determines the outcome of our lives. T.L. Osborne, he would say in private, it's easy to get people to believe in God but it's much harder to get them to believe in themselves. And so, yes, we're to have self-esteem. Yes, you're to believe in yourself. And yes, 
it's okay to say that you can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. But this is why your choices matter, your decisions matter, what you do, what you do that no one knows about matters because all of those things, they either build up your confidence or they chip away at your confidence. And that can make it hard to believe God. Prosperity and success are all about what's on the inside. And success and the blessing of the Lord flow out from a life that is right within. And that's why what Jesus said is true. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Why don't we all say it? Say righteousness. Righteousness. Why don't we say it? Say right living. Say right doing. Say right conduct. Right Right actions. Right Right character. And, and listen, I understand. This is very unusual in 2024. You know, I, I mentioned a few weeks ago, we're, we're not doing a Disney theme out in the atrium. We're not having the, the worship team do a Disney song. That would be a lack of integrity. And so I know to gather in church and to hear about old-fashioned values and character and conduct and integrity, it's not the most popular thing going on. But Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things. What things? The things that people spend all of their time putting first, chasing after, mention get rich quick schemes. They're scheming, they're scamming, doing all that. What? Trying to get ahead. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given, added to you as well. The blessing of the Lord flows out from a man or woman that is right on the inside. Matthew 12, beginning in verse 33, make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad for a tree is recognized by its fruit. Yes, we know that our Lord said, judge not. And so we don't run around sticking our nose in everything. We don't run around judging everything. But we also know that he said that we recognize a tree how? By its fruit. So we have eyes. We can see. Hopefully you were raised by some people with character and integrity. We have eyes so we can see. Amen. We have some wisdom. We have some common sense so we can observe. A bad tree bears what kind of fruit? Bad fruit. And a good tree bears what kind of fruit? Good fruit. I know this is some high concept stuff in 2024. This morning, Pastor Sue was asking Jessica about her peaches, how her peach trees are doing in between the heat and then too much rain and end of May and June, they're not not doing so well. But but a peach tree produces what kind of fruit? You know, we we are not going to get home and the peach tree have signs up around it saying that it now identifies as an apple tree or something else. See, we, we live in a culture that has lost its collective mind. But see, Jesus said a tree is recognized by what? By its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you or evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And you you might just be born again, you might just be saved, and maybe your words, your mouth are something you have to work on, and maybe, you know, when you're at work and around other people, you got to watch what you say. You know, you might ask, well, how do I change what's coming out of my mouth? Well, you have to change what you are depositing in your heart and in your life. The good man, what kind of man? The good man. We could say the good woman. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. So the good things of life come from within from the inside. And that's why we're to renew our minds to the word of God, amen? You know, it was just a holiday. You know, and so the ki- kids were swimming and you know, it's a holiday. And so I'll put on old music like the Beach Boys. You know, that, that's not gonna hurt our spirits. But you know, it, it's harmless. There's, there's no cuss words. I'm, I'm not gonna hear about Samuel this week at basketball camp cussing someone out because of what we were listening to by the pool. You understand. So you've got to filter what you watch. You've got to filter what you, you listen to. And our lives, the great majority of the time, it's not the Beach Boys for July 4th. It is worship music. You know, we're, we're in a new stage of life where our two oldest girls, they're coming up during the week and they're doing, they're doing band with the youth band. They're learning how to play for worship. 
You know, and I shouldn't say this because they're sitting in this service. You know, uh, my parents had to pull teeth to get me to practice. They signed me up for piano lessons and they had to the, basically make me practice. And I remember Aaron Wood would pick me and some other young men up and, you know, we'd practice here at practice, but there wasn't a whole lot of practicing at home. And so it just is so special to be in my office and to hear one of them playing the piano and, and one of them singing. See, the, the right things are being deposited, so the right things are coming out. And we're to all be doing that in our lives. Verse 36, I tell you, men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So we're, we're going to be judged. We're going to be judged. And there, there's this idea out there in Christendom that grace means we just, we're good to go, we're going to heaven, live however we want, but we're going to have to give an account. We're going to have to give an account. Jesus said, by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. So why does right living matter? Why does right conduct matter? Why do right words matter? Why does integrity matter? Because when we're not living the way we should, these are the things that chip away at our confidence. And it chips away at your heart. And it's a matter of answered prayer. John writes in 1 John 3, beginning in verse 21, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and we do what pleases Him. We obey His commands and we do what pleases God. We obey his commands and we do what pleases the Lord. So last week, as an example, I mentioned finances and how people head down this road of not wanting to do things God's way, which is seed time and harvest, which is little by little, line upon line, precept upon precept. People want what's quick. People want what's easy. People are always looking for shortcuts but those things always lead to ruin. There might be something temporary, but it is just that it is temporary. And so last Sunday, I mentioned Pastor's book, 80-10-10. And somebody might say, well, that, that's so simple, but are you taking action on something that is simple? So $100 crosses my hands or $100 crosses your hands. What is 80-10-10? 801010 is that it is the principle and it is a biblical principle that $10 out of that 100 it belongs to the Lord. And so I bring it to the house of the Lord to honor God. I bring it to the house of the Lord to put God first. But that that's just the beginning. That is I was thinking about this during 9 a.m. It is the baseline. What is a baseline? The minimum standards of conduct. The minimum standards of expectation. You know, God has been blessing St. Paul's, and I heard that we, we've got a team this school year that there's going to be tryouts for. Well, see, this, this is a whole new level, because I, I don't think we've ever had to do tryouts for anything. So what do tryouts mean? There's a baseline. There is standard. Tryouts mean that if you don't push that soda away and get outside in this Texas heat and practice, you may not play. That's what a baseline means. That's what standards mean. That's what tryouts mean. And think about this in this culture that we live in 2024. You know, if we lower standards or lower the baseline, are people going to meet those standards or are they going to they devolve down even less? Less. If, you know, Pastor and I have been challenging everybody, don't, when you're in town, be in the house of the Lord and don't just be on time, be early. What if we said, come late? What if we said worship isn't really that important? Well, what if, what if we said, you know, you can skip the worship part and just be here for the night? Well, what would that do? Would people rise to that lower standard and exceed it, or would they, they fall down to that lower standard? And so the, this thing now in the church of reluctance to talk about money and not receiving an offering and putting an offering basket at the back or putting a kiosk at the back and, and only occasionally saying, well, if you want to give this or do that, what is that doing? It is lowering the standards. But see, when you lower the standards, is there more victory or less victory? 
Less. There, is there more blessing or less blessing? See, Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. The last Sunday or two, I challenge you to read Matthew 5 through 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. If you read it honestly, you'll, you'll, you'll realize that Jesus did not lower standards. He raised the standards. Because of all that he did for us, more is expected of us. We are to be like who? Who's our example? The Lord Jesus Christ. We can learn from Moses. We can learn from David. But who is our example? Who are we to be like? Who are we to follow? The Lord Jesus Christ. So, Haiti 10.10. $100 crosses my hands. First $10, it belongs to the Lord. It is his. So I bring it to the house of the Lord. I honor God. I put him first. But we don't stop there. Then the second $10, it belongs to you. Say, say it belongs to me. And listen, we're, we're all hardwired differently. I think generally we're Americans, so as Americans, we like to spend. But some of us are spenders and some of us are savers and some, are, some of us are in between that. Now, don't ask your husband or wife about this right now or at lunch. Got to all walk in love, amen. But the second step is that when $100 crossed your hands, $10 belongs to the Lord, but $10 belongs to you, to your future, to your children, to your grandchildren. I've heard my father joke about how sometimes being out west, you see people with bumper stickers on their RV that says, I'm spending my children's inheritance. Well, that may be funny when you first see it, but it is not godly. Before COVID, one of the George Bonner surveys before COVID said that out of all church-going Americans, only 3% of church-going Americans even claimed a tithe. The number for conservative evangelicals was only 8%. Now that's pre-COVID, so I, I'm sure today it's even less. And you get online and start Googling and looking at statistics for Americans and saving money, you'll be discouraged because it is frightening how, few Amer how many Americans are living paycheck to paycheck and they have no savings whatsoever. But as I said, when you start out down this road, it's not exciting at first because it's little by little step by step, precept upon precept. But you do the right thing year after year, month after month, decade after decade, over time, there's gonna be some blessing. You're gonna have something to leave behind for your children and your grandchildren. So the right way is God's way. The right way is God's way. So people say or believe one thing and do another. And what is that? It is a lack of integrity. So don't be divided in your words or beliefs and actions. Don't speak or act in a way that causes your heart to condemn you. Speak and act and live so you'll have confidence, not, not just in God and his word, but you'll have confidence in you and who you are in Christ Jesus. As T.L. Osborne said to us, you won't just believe in God, you'll believe in yourself. That, that you can do all things through Christ Jesus. That when you pray, your heart does not condemn you because you're doing what you ought to be doing. You're living the way you ought to be living. You're acting the way you ought to be acting. You're handling money the way you ought to be handling money. Too many of God's people limit their success and the blessing of the Lord because they lack integrity. To be blessed by God requires both character and integrity. And that's why a lot of what we see out there is not the blessing of the Lord. Somebody might say, well, you know, I don't understand people doing what's wrong and having something. That is not the blessing of the Lord. See, Satan props people up. He elevates people. He makes the wrong people famous to lead people astray. You might say, that, that's too much. I don't know if I can believe it. You, you better believe it. And that's why, G, that's why Paul wrote, that the wages of sin, it is death. See, Satan may make someone popular temporarily or permit them to have something temporarily. It is to lead them to destruction. It is to lead everyone that they influence to destruction. And then at the end of the day, they end up where? They end up dead and they end up in hell. And they pay the price. And those influenced by them, they pay the price. To be blessed by God requires both character and integrity. Look at Matthew 12, verse 37, for by your words you will be acquitted, 
By your words, you will be condemned. So we've dealt with this. Are you a man of your word? Are you a woman of your word? Can people count on you? Are you on time? Do you get the job done? Do you finish before you leave? Can people count on you? Can your husband count on you? Can your wife count on you? That you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. That you're where you are supposed to be. That you're busy doing what you are supposed to be busy doing. Are you a person of integrity? And it's not just people counting on us. It is the Lord counting on us. Proverbs 10 verse 9, the man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. That's shortcuts. That's taking the, the broad way that leads to destruction. That's doing things your way. That's trying to do things somehow a way other than God's way. The man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. Why does it matter what we do? Why does it matter what we say? Why does it matter how we live? Why does it matter how we conduct ourselves? Because as we learned last Sunday, a good name is of greater value than gold, silver, or riches. We, we ought not any of us be doing anything where someday our children will Google us and be embarrassed. Our children will want to change their name. A good name is more valuable than gold or silver or riches. The man of integrity walks securely. It's about being able to sleep at night. It's about having the peace of God. He who takes crooked paths will be found out. So it's about getting all the force of your life lined up and moving in the same direction. Jesus said in Matthew 12, verse 25, every kingdom, we could say house, divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. Say this, say, a lack of integrity will limit, will hinder my level of blessing. The, the fact that we're going to build, the fact that we're going to expand, the fact that we're going to expand for the church or school, this is good news. Because to do it, God is going to have to bless us and increase us. But there's a question that has to be asked, and that is, can we handle it? You see, if, if a man or woman cannot handle their current level of income, why would God double it? Why would God triple it? Why would God entrust them with more? See, he knows us, and he knows our hearts. And that's why I caution you and I warn you that just because someone on social media, which is such a lie, just because someone looks to be a success or looks to be famous, you, you don't know, it could all be rented. And by the time you get done with filters, we all look awesome. <laughs> you know, we, we did photos, family photos recently. You better believe, you know, Jessica insists I have some gray hair. There won't be any gray hair in the Christmas card. <laughs> I'm teasing. See, we're, we're, we get so distracted by things that aren't even real. We get so distracted by things that are a, a lie, a deception. Say, that, say it again, say a lack of integrity will limit my level of blessing. You know, I'm like my father. I like, I like cars, and I like things that are loud, and I like things that go fast. And, you know, so I'm a part of several groups and forums and read, read posts, and I never cease to be amazed that someone will go buy a, a car with a great engine on credit, and then they'll ask in the group if they can put the cheap gas in. It ain't going to last. It ain't going to work. Cheap oil, cheap gas, you're going to ruin that engine. You're going to ruin that car. You, you are limiting the sound. You're limiting how fast you can go. You are limiting your acceleration. Well, see, people do the same thing with God when they have a lack of integrity. And they say, well, you know, Austin, you're preaching about faith and character and conduct and integrity. I, I think I'm going to go do the Moana theme service. Well, see, you are, you are limiting what God can do in your life. And you're limiting what God can do through your life. People have no faith because they lack singleness of purpose. They have no faith because they lack integrity. Their words and their actions have no integrity. Success and prosperity flow out of a confidence-filled life. So don't live in such a way. Don't talk in such a way. Don't do things in such a way that you chip away at your own confidence. Don't live in such a way that your heart condemns you. 
1 John 3 and verse 21, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, people have no faith because they have no integrity. So instead they're envious or jealous. They, they might at church act like Mother Teresa and then the devil on Monday. What is that? That is a lack of integrity. And you might say, well, Austin, I don't understand that they, they seem to have something. It's temporary. Tell your neighbor, say it's temporary. Read Galatians 6. Do not be deceived. A man reaps what he sows. Do not be deceived. A woman reaps what she sows. So see, somebody may have something today, but if they're not a person of integrity, it is temporary. They're being used. They're being used by others. They're being used by Satan. And at some point, it is all going to fall apart. So don't let people work against in your life, your peace, your happiness, your home, your children, your marriage. Focus. Tell your neighbor, smile at your neighbor and say, focus. focus. Smile at your other neighbor and say, focus. focus. You know, I'm under no illusions. People do wrong and people sin and our heart's desire is that they come to church and hear the word of God and they, they get convicted and they respond to the Holy Spirit and they repent and they, act, they ask the Lord's forgiveness and they, they do what's right. Where, where the line gets drawn at Faith Christian Center is when someone is doing wrong and they're trying to lead others into sin. When someone is not just tearing down their own life or their own marriage or their own family, but they're trying to tear down the homes or the marriages or the families of others. You know, in the last few months, I heard about a wrong connection. Someone, lady getting connected to another lady, just can, insistent on doing what's wrong, insistent on detonating her life, her marriage, her family. And, and I heard about these two ladies being best buds. You know what my thought was? Who has time for all this? If you're a wife and if you're a mother, aren't you, don't you have things to be busy with? If you're a husband, and a father, don't you have things to be busy with? Isn't there some work to be done? Aren't there some sales calls to be made? Aren't there some kids to be picked up? Isn't there some volunteering that can be done? Who has time to get off track? People who lack integrity, which is focus. And see, people head down those roads, and Satan is laughing his rear end off, because the wages of sin, it is death. As Jesus said, the broad road leads where? To destruction. So why do we preach the way we do? And why do we warn the way we do? And why might Pastor Sue or Jessica sit someone down? Because we love the people of God and we do not want them to be led to destruction. Like the lamb being led to the slaughter. You watch a show where cattle are being lined up. They look so happy. They have no idea where they are going. Jessica showed me a video this week where a little girl was eating some bacon, and her mom shouldn't have done this. Her mom told her that bacon comes from Peppa Pig. That, that girl, yeah, she, she's, uh, she's going to need some prayer after that. So God loves us. And so Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness so that we walk in the goodness of God and the blessing of God in every area of life. So we're to have integrity. We're to be people of our word. We're not to, be, we're not to say one thing and do another. We're not to be double-minded. James 1, beginning in verse 5, says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the, by the wind, that man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded, unstable in all he does. So we're not to be double-minded. We're, we're to have some focus. We're to have some integrity. We're to be faithful. There's another old-fashioned word. We're to be consistent. Here's some more. We're to be reliable. And when we, we tell someone we're going we're to do something or we're going to be somewhere, we ought to be people of our word. And if for whatever reason something comes up, we ought to ask their forgiveness. I learned that from my parents. They, they might say we were going to go do this or that. 
and then something came up, maybe somebody in the hospital or something related to the ministry, they would, they would sit us down. They would say, I know that we said we were going to do this. This came up. And so I want to ask your forgiveness. We're to be people of our word. And our God is a God of his word. Our heavenly father walks in integrity and he expects us to walk in integrity. People reap a negative harvest because they lack integrity. And that's true 100% of the time. At some point in the spring, I said, a deception of Satan is that we get to thinking the rules don't apply to us. And we get to thinking that the, the word of God doesn't apply to us. For instance, Proverbs, that a man who takes crooked paths will be found out. That's a lie. That's a deception. Why don't we say, say the rules apply to me? What, say this, say the word of God applies to me. Say this, say the standards of Almighty God, they apply to me. See, a deception of Satan is that well, well, don't, they don't apply to me. I, I, just, I can just do whatever I'm going to do and violate the rules. and they, don't, they do. All the rules apply. So Paul tells us that bad company corrupts good character. That is true 100% of the time. Paul writes in Galatians 6, do not be deceived, which means people are deceived about this. A man or woman, they reap what they sow. That is true 100% of the time. So if you sow destruction in someone else's home or their marriage or their family or you give someone else's child wrong, wicked advice, guess what you're going to reap? You're going to reap that, but not equally. You're going to reap a harvest, 30, 60, and 100 fold. And you might say, man, I only thought that worked with the blessing of the Lord. It works in every area of life. Because this is the way Father God designed things. Seed time and harvest. People reap a negative harvest because they lack integrity. Matthew 12, 37, again, Jesus said, by your words you'll be acquitted and by your words you'll be condemned. Proverbs 26, verse 27 is a good one. And this is why we encourage you not just to do the daily Bible reading, but throughout the month to read the proverb of the day because it'll build wisdom into your life. And it'll warn you about basic life issues that if you head down certain roads, they will lead to destruction. Here's a good one. Proverbs 26, verse 27. If a man digs a pit, he will fall into it. If a man rolls a stone, it will roll back on him. Somebody might wonder, well, why, why, why is Pastor or Aaron or Austin, why, why aren't they concerned about someone seeking to do harm? And why don't they let it worry them or bother them? Why, why, why do they go to sleep with the peace of God? Why are they not afraid? Because I know what the word says, that if a man or woman digs a pit, they will fall into it. If a man or woman rolls a stone, it will roll back onto them. So what am I doing? I'm just doing the next right thing. That's what Lester Summerall told my parents all those years ago. He said, just live, live a good, clean, straight, moral life. Don't ever do anything you don't want to see on the front page of the newspaper. Today we would say, don't do anything you don't want to see on social media. You may think you want to go viral, but you don't. You don't. Tell your neighbor, say, you don't. You'd be like, man, I'm going to be famous, and I'm going to be an influencer, and you know, I'm going to sit in my pajamas and post on Instagram and make money. You don't want to go viral. People do all that. They're, they're unhappy. They're, they're miserable. They're suicidal. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Trouble, trouble, trouble. Towards the end of his life, Dr. Ed Cole, who had a ministry for men, he told my parents, he said, I am satisfied with my life. I have maintained my honor and my integrity. Once my father asked Lester Summerall about another minister, and Summerall warned my father about that man. He said, he has no honor and he lives by no code. And later that, that man, he, he detonated his marriage, detonated his ministry, and just waves of destruction. And some are all said about him, he has no honor, he lives by no code. So see, something may seem to be big or popular today, but if there is a lack of integrity, some point in the future, it's all gonna fall apart. Say it again, say a lack of integrity. It will limit my level of blessing. And it's not just saying, you know what? I'm gonna do what's right. I'm gonna say what's right. 
I'm going to focus on what I'm supposed to be busy about so I have a good harvest in this life. It's also about eternity. It's also about eternity. And that's why, again, one of the, the greatest lies currently in the body of Christ is that grace means that we can just live however we want. You cannot honestly read the New Testament and believe that. Pick any letter by the Apostle Paul. Pick even a short one like Philemon. You cannot read any part of the New Testament and believe that lie. It is impossible. What does integrity have to do with eternity? Revelation 21, beginning in verse 7, he who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, what a word for 2024. The vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, and all liars. So anyone practicing lies or falsehood, all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So see, the, the world says things like, well, we're all God's children. That's, that's not true. And that's not biblically true. Someone is a child of God if they have professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's that mindset, well, we just live how we want. We can just do whatever we want. We can just act and conduct ourselves how we want. And we're all going to be in the city of God someday. Notice what it says in Revelation. Those, look at the middle part of verse 8. Those who practice. That's the issue. And if you read the Apostle Paul and you read his letters, you'll find that language throughout his letters. And that's the issue. See, someone may be tempted. Someone may sin. Someone may make a mistake. Someone may speak in a way that's unrighteous. Someone may do something that is unrighteous. But if, as we sang about in that third song, if their heart is right... They come to the house of God or they read their Bible at home or, or they're just quiet enough for the Holy Spirit to talk to them. They will be convicted over that sin. And what we're all to do is to respond to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We're to repent. We're to ask the Lord's forgiveness. And we're not to do that again. We're not to do that again. We're not to do that again. The issue is when somebody who claims Christ becomes a practitioner of something that is evil and wicked. Finances, a practitioner, someone who's constantly ripping people off, someone who's constantly lying to people in business, someone who's constantly, as they say in technology, selling vaporware or products that don't exist. The issue is being a practitioner of wickedness. And as followers of Christ, we are to be practitioners of righteousness. See first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And friends, we all have plenty to work on. If you're a husband, a father, you can be a better husband, you can be a better father. Whatever you do for a living, you can be better at it, you can do better at it. With, at it. If you're a wife, if you're a mother, if you're, you, you can be a better wife, you can be a better mother, you can be better at whatever it is you do. We all have plenty to work on. And so in our lives, we ought to be saying, I'm going to be a person of integrity. And if there's anything that needs to be changed, if there's anything that needs to be repented of, if there's anything that needs to be done different, I'm going to handle it. I'm going to change. I'm going to walk with the Lord in integrity and righteousness. And I'll, I'll end where we ended last Sunday. That's how you can get to the end of your life. It's not just about, it is about sleep, sleeping with the peace of God every night. But it's also so you can get to the end of your life and your spouse isn't ashamed of you, your children aren't ashamed of you, ashamed of you. you know, at whatever level of blessing there is, even if you're just sitting on your porch in the country, don't, don't have a whole lot, if you leave a good name, that is everything. At the end of your life, you have lived with integrity. So you can hear the Lord Jesus Christ say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what it's all about. The noise, the distractions, got to set all of that aside and have singleness of purpose. Why don't we bow our heads? Say this, say, the Holy Spirit of God, lead me, 
Guide me, direct me, speak to me, and show me if there is anything in my life that is wrong, anything that lacks integrity, anything that you're, you're the Word of God condemns. Show it to me because I will repent of it. I will change. I will do what's right. I will walk in integrity. Please keep your head bowed, your head bowed, your eyes closed. You might be here today and perhaps you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. God loves you and he has a wonderful plan and purpose for your life. But it all begins by surrendering your life unto him. This world that we live in, there are, there are so many lies. And one of them is that if we're just good enough that that is sufficient, we'll be in heaven someday. It's a lie. The Bible says that we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We are all in need of a savior. Another lie is that you can come up with your own way to God, your own path to God. That, that is a lie. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if you want to be saved, if you want to be brought into right standing with God, there's only one way, and it's by giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. You might be here today and say, Austin, I have never done that, but I want to. I want to pray the prayer, and I want to ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord and to be the Savior of my life. That's you this morning, wherever you're seated. Say, Austin, that's me. Pray for me. I want to give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's you, wherever you're seated. Raise your hand to where I'll see it. I'll know you want me to pray with you. Say, Austin, pray with me. You might also be here today and at a time in your life you prayed a prayer, but you know in your heart you've not been living for God. You know in your heart you've been doing your own thing. And the truth is because of that, you have paid the price. I bring you good news. Our Heavenly Father, He is gracious. He is merciful. What the Word of God says is true, that He restores the years the locusts have eaten. But we have to do some things, like that prodigal. We have to wake up and realize that we've got to come home and we've got to do things the Father's way. We've got to do what the Word says in 1 John 1, 9. We've got to confess our sins. And when we do that, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you're here today and say, Austin, that's me. Pray with me. I want to leave knowing that I have peace with God. I want to leave knowing today that I have made things right with God. If that's you, wherever you're seated, raise your hand to where I'll see it and I'll know you want me to pray with you. Say, Austin, pray with me. I want to Make things right with God before I leave today. If you raised your hand or didn't, or you were hesitant, I'm gonna ask that you pray with me. You might be also watching or listening online now or later, and the Lord is dealing with your heart. Repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I repent of my sins, and I ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Thank you for welcoming me into your family. Thank you for a new beginning and a fresh start. Thank you for setting me free of anything that would hinder me in living for you. In Jesus' name. And Heavenly Father, I thank you by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the anointing that is present. I know it is not your will that any of us live in bondage. I know that it is not your will that any of us struggle. I know that it is not your will that any of us struggle with practicing righteousness because there is some stumbling block in our lives. I know that your will is perfect freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ so that we would be practitioners of righteousness. 
And so I say, in the name of Jesus, by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command people that have had an ongoing struggle, or an ongoing struggle with practicing a deed of darkness, of wickedness, I command them to be set free in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we plead the blood of Jesus over them. We plead the blood of Jesus over their body. We plead the blood of Jesus over their mind. We thank you that what your word says is true, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And we give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' name. You see, that is biblical Christianity. Not that we're supposed to struggle with this or that until we get to heaven. If the power and the anointing of God can heal somebody that is sick in their body or crippled in their body, can the power of the Lord Jesus Christ not set a man or woman free? And so I believe with all my heart that if in your heart you no longer want to practice this or that, and if you ask the Lord for help, he'll help you. And if you ask the Holy Spirit for his power and his strength and his anointing, he'll help you. And I believe that what the word says is true, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And that's why the Apostle Paul could write, that is what some of you you might say, Austin, I, I've tried, and I've tried, and I've tried. That's because you've been doing it in your own strength. Can I ask the Lord for his help? You know, if you've never read the book, Teen Ch the, book the Cross and the Switchblade by David Wilkerson, you should. At 9 a.m., my father mentioned David Wilkerson and mentioned Teen Challenge. But if you read that book, The Cross and the Switchblade, young men their lives wrecked by gangs and drugs. You might say, well, what was the secret, secret ingredient of getting young men set free? It was the power of the Holy Spirit. And then those young men being surrounded by godly men of integrity and having righteous examples.